And I think it's a good way to introduce it, the way that uh, it's brought in. I think it's a very interesting period. D- dare I mention the Dan Busters and say it's, it's, <laughs> it's a similar sort of period to that. Maybe he's, you know, he's gone, this is the alternative. This is what most of the raids were like at that period. Maybe he's highlighting mm. that to, to, as a counterpoint to the Dan Busters. <laughs> Welcome to the Dam Castives, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Following on from last week's discussion with the cast and crew of the Radio 4 adaptation of Len Dyson's Bomber, I felt it was important that we spent a bit of time chatting about Bomber's place in the historiography of the RAF and Bomber Command specifically. And to do this, I'm joined by two fantastic historians. We have Dr. Dan Elin, who is the archivist and historian for the International Bomber Command Center Digital Archive, which is housed at the University of Lincoln. And we have James Jeffries, who's doing his PhD on the RAF in popular culture, and he's finding some fantastic stuff. Now, what we're going to do as fans of the book and the adaptation is talk about some of the themes that it comes up, and we're going to delve into things like lack of moral fibre, on which Dan has done a lot of work. So we're going to be picking Bomber apart a bit to see where it fits in the wider history of Bomber Command and how it should be viewed today, because it is a very 1960s, 1970s book and a very 90s adaptation. So... Without further ado, we'll dive straight into our conversation, and I'll apologize now, I do talk a bit more in this one than I do usually. Sorry about that. I suppose that let's put Bomber within its within its context here. So it's um Dighton writes it in the late sixties, it comes out what, seventy, seventy one in seven seventy here, seventy one in the States, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh and then I think paperback was seventy two here, I think. Um so it, it, sit, it sits in an interesting place in the sort of cultural history, isn't it? Because you have that whole, I don't want to say 60s backlash, but there's a, there's a very fixed view of, of Bomber Command at this point. What sort of world is it landing into when, when Dighton does this? Because you know, he's, he's coming off the spy books by the time he gets onto these. So it's, it's quite a departure for him, but he's, he's tapping into something, isn't he? I think f- for me, he's kind of he's, he's kind of leading the way. Um, it's it's really before the veterans all start publishing their memoirs. Um, there's been a few, but but not that not that many. Um, and it's it's kind of leading the way of telling the story. I think I mean all the the, the veterans are what mid late forties, fifties when when this when this book comes out. So they're they're sort of starting to sit back and take stock and want to tell the story. Um, 
but it even with what comes later it's it's way above and beyond anything else that's 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 around at the time it's um yeah yeah i don't know people said groundbreaking as far as it goes it's you know the the research he's, he did for the book and it's the the way that it's put together with the multiple perspectives and the intertwined narratives that you know mm. i mean the the copy i I looked for my copy and I've I've lent it to some bugger who's not giving me it back and I had to go out and buy another one. Um, no, <laughs> it's not me. And yeah, you know, it's it's now uh, it's a penguin modern classic now. So it's um, it's an important book and it's yeah the the way it tells a story is just uh, hasn't been done before and I don't think it's been done since you know, to the to the same same extent really. I think Len tried tried to capture that sort of lightning in a bottle again with some of his other second world war books but never quite quite got there did he james what what's your take on the book yeah i mean it comes out yeah at the end of the 60s you've had by then the sort of public perceptions of the raf bomber command is now sort of going as that memory of the dam busters and that next generation has discovered them through that film fighter command you've got the battle of britain 69 the year before um you started as well. You've got things as felt like beyond the fringe where you've got that sketch where they're doing the Perkins. I wish I could go with you, all that sort of thing. And Monty Python as well. That are Suddenly there's this comic element, the RAF. It's not quite the, um, the glamour that's used to be. It, it's moved on from the sort of, I don't know, reach for the skies, angels, one five, as I say, Dan busters again, it, it's, it's starting to get a new sort of identity and memory, but also this other generation coming out. And I think the thing, I mean, and, and Dayton's obviously had his success with the um, the Chris Farl and Funeral in Berlin. And yeah, I did, did, you get the sense that he's written this as, um, and I don't know whether he said this, but it, it feels like something he's really wanted to do. And I really credit him for the research he's done. He's gone to Germany, he's talked to, to people there, and he's decided to take it and, and tell this story from multiple perspectives, which is quite unusual before and quite unusual since, I think. Um, and the themes and, and topics that are dealt with there, I mean, we, we'll talk about LMF later and things like that, I think are, you know, things that aren't really discussed. So you get hints of it in a film like Appointment in London and, and such like, but this is very much stamped. And are we allowed to give too many spoilers? Uh, are we assuming people haven't The books were well, 50 years, 53 years old now. The, the adaptation we'll get onto in a minute is that's nearly 30. Hmm. So ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't, yeah. Well, to be fair, if you listen to last week's episode, it's already been spoiled for you. So, yeah, Spo the spoilers so, galore. Go know. for it. But yeah, you know, you've got the, the letters at the end, the, the, the two, you know, the one uh, where Lambert's dismissed the duties and, and such. And the other thing I really like about it is you have a description of what happens to the survivors afterwards in the epilogue. I think that's a really interesting section to have as well. Um, and we'll talk about the, the adaptation in, in, in a bit, but the way that that's sort of handled with Tom Baker's narration is just absolutely. Yeah, awesome. I mean, while yeah. while we're we're giving spoilers away, it's the the decision to make it a fictitious operation by a fictitious squadron from a station that doesn't mm. exist uh, to a target that doesn't exist on a day that never happened is 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 quite an interesting one. Yeah. But I mean, you know, he's he's an author. He writes he writes fiction, so it's 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 fair enough, I suppose. If he, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's tricky ground if you're sort of writing historical faction and you know telling this story with so much, um, so much speculation and imagination and and storytelling. But it's, you know, I don't know. I mean, if if uh, if history books are allowed to just concentrate on a descriptive narrative uh, rather than you know the academic sources and research and footnotes and things you know this it's 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 a, it's a way to go i don't think i I, th I think it's mm. it's that space he gives him because you know he's he's very much writing in a time when uh the, su the survivors of the campaign are still around and i guess he's buying himself that space to be able to let let's be fair it is the worst night possible for that squadron, the Pathfinders, and the German city. It's its just a comp compendium of horrors, isn't it? Like, I suppose that's his, his point in this, that whereas there's moments of humor, you have a lot of darkness in it from whether it's the class elements going on in the squadron between 
between Sweet and and, and Lambert. You've got uh, the anti-Semitism with with Kosher, uh, the young engineer. Then in in Germany, you've got you know. T- to be fair, I think the the one bit of it that doesn't quite sit well with me is the shoehorned in comedy SS pair that sort of show up to start ripping off the tailor and things. I, I think that's probably a bit mm. a bit much for 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 what else he has going on. Um because he doesn't he doesn't need them there to get Anna Louise and, mm-hmm. and Hansel into the into the basement. But uh, it's it's not a fun read. Oh God no, it's traumatic and the radio yeah. show is equally mm. you know I listened to that um yesterday yeah. or the day before. And yeah, it's horrible. I mean the the multiple narratives and multiple perspectives things is really important um for for both the book and the radio play but it is kind of like it is the worst case for both sides of the of the war it's you know it is for the germans it's hamburg or dresden for the rf it's nuremberg it's mm-hmm. you know the suffering on both sides is is you know just just incredible um as far as the scale goes yeah, yeah. so it's um the 31st of june 1943 a Saturday that doesn't exist, or a day, as you said, on a day that doesn't exist. That's an interesting point to put it in because that's really the ramping up of the strategic bomber cam- campaign that's going to only get more so from then. Do you think he chooses 43 because it's this moment where he can fit in without it having to explain too much? He can have things like, like Oboe, H2S, where the, the crews are still complaining about them. Um, have these new tricks and toys, but also have them go wrong. Because if it's much later, you're going to have more than just, I think he, he has four or five Pathfinder mosquitoes that, that go wrong, isn't it? So he's gi- he's giving himself a little bit of breathing room there that it's early enough that these things can break quite easily, but also late enough that there's going to be, he's able to send, what was it, um, 700 aircraft up at a time. Do you think he, he Len, chose it or put it in the right period because of what it allowed him to do? Yes. That was the, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that's and that's the answer. Let's move on to the next question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, there's, it was, you know, it was a, a war of the, the scientists as much as it was the, the guys yeah. um, flying or on the ground, you know. So he could have, he could probably have put it any, any time from the date he chose onwards. And I think that the, the radio play did a, picked a different date, but um, it's still 43. Yeah, Feb- February 43, um, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, would have, it would have probably worked yeah. in 44 as well, mm. less so perhaps in 45. Yeah. I mean, I, I think as well, you've, you've got the, it, it fits in with the, the sort of Battle of the Ruhr and the, the Happy Valley being mentioned um, a lot in the book, you know, it was Happy Valley again and and in the radio adapt, adaptation. Um yeah, I, I think it makes sense, as you say, Matt, to, to put it there, because it is before you've had the Battle of Berlin and the Nuremberg Raid. It's before sort of, you know, the D-Day. It's before Dresden, but it's after a massive learning curve, so to speak. It's it's after a, a huge period of, of Bomber Command developing and um, getting used to that technology. And I think it's a good way to introduce it, the way that uh, it's brought in. I think it's a very interesting period. Dare I mention the Dan Busters and say it's 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 a similar sort of period to that? Maybe he's you know he's gone. This is the alternative. This is what most of the raids were like at that period. Maybe he's highlighting mm. that to, to, as a counterpoint to the Dan Busters. Sorry, Every, to everybody them, drinks. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So w- working with the IBCC Digital Archive, we're, we're not doing so many vit- veteran I- interviews now for for obvious reasons. But when we started the project, we recruited an awful lot of. Uh, volunteers and train them to do oral history interviews. Um, some of them didn't really have, they might have had a background in history, but maybe not so much background or, or the knowledge about Bomber Command. I used to recommend that they read this novel as, you know, to, to get a handle on the stories they might be told um, so they could understand some of the things, you know, um, some of the navigation aids and, and, and the way things worked and what different crew members might be talking about. So, you know, it's, it's, I've, I've found it really useful. And I think the, the, the volunteers that we, we trained up also, you know, it's a great way of introducing um, the, the subject. Similarly, I, I point to the radio adaptation as well. You know, I say, if you want to, if you want something, look at this, 
you know, if, if you don't really have much of an idea about it and what it was like and what was happening. Yeah. Just, do you give them, yeah. do you give them trigger warnings? And <laughs> Oh yes, I do. I'm not that mean. <laughs> Believe I, it or not. It was, it's been weird. I, when I first started talking to everybody about doing the reunion and I, I mentioned it to, to James, this was February time and I, I dusted the, the book off the, the shelf and had a read of it. And only it was over Christmas. I'd reread good, um, goodbye Mickey mouse. And in my head, the two had kind of conflated a little bit. Yep. And then you read Bomber and it's, it's an infinitely better novel. But like, like you say, it's, there isn't a moment in it, nor in the adaptation either, where a punch is pulled. It's, it's always to the point. And, you know, ev even from when the, the cookie drops on the, the armor, you know, it's, it's, it's the, fore, the mm. foreshadowing of just how bad that's going to get. Granted, you, you know where that cookie's going to end up. Um, mm. But it's that thing that just shows, and I think that's a really important point as well, is that accidents happen and things went wrong on station, you know, entire aircraft would blow up, the, the whole thing, because you're dealing with, you know, weapons of war that are made to be as light and as flimsy as possible to carry as much ordnance as possible. So it, it doesn't, wouldn't take much for them to go up. And I think that's, that's interesting um, that he chooses to do that, but then holds back from the whole thing exploding. Cause he has, yeah, the, the creaking door crew running off saying it's going to go and, and things like that. It's really him on the top of his game. You know, and I, I, I love the, what became known as the Harry Palmer books. Cause he's not, he doesn't have a name in the first, to does he in the Ipcris files the other one go back and check it out folks harry palmer is named in the movies not in the book now i'm getting two confused looks now they're, they're gonna they're, they're both googling to check me out but it's yeah it, it's it's just really really good but i guess that that before we just get on to the adaptation the reception for it at the time was quite but it, it was that weird period that it the missing booker prize as well that they then said it was going to be. It says on Wikipedia, that source of all knowledge, that in 2011 they had a, a lost Booker Prize for 70, and it, it was it was on the the long list for that. Didn't make the short oh, okay. list, which is which is interesting. Oh, okay. um, and of course, the most important thing, Motorhead named their third album after it. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Thank thank you thank you Lemmy. Um, but I, I guess yeah, because it, it was. It was a big hit. Let's sort of segue into the adaptation before we start picking uh, picking it apart a bit. Putnam tried to make it as a film in the eighties, couldn't get the money, and ended up doing Memphis Bell. Um, I think it was you telling me, James, that the letters in it are RAF letters in Memphis Bell. Was it you? Yes, I can't remember yeah. where I read that, but yeah, um, I mean it's a it's a haunting scene to to think of as well you know the the uh the letters being mm -hmm. read to the families and uh, yeah it, it, it's incredibly powerful with the real mm -hmm. footage being shown and i think that's another thing actually that bomber on the radio does is uh you're cut to a veteran you're cut to someone underneath the bombs you're cut to you know someone being interviewed about dropping the bombs and that just that reminder of that realism is incredibly powerful because you'll be engrossed with the drama and then all of a sudden there'll be this voice and it's just that that reality check that I think is incredibly powerful, which you get with the docudrama very often, you know, with, with interviews and the drama being played out. Sometimes it's not very good. Sometimes it can be manipulated. But in these cases, I think with Bomber, certainly, and, and that scene in Memphis Bell, it's just, it's a really, but really the, powerful The thing moment. that's different with it being a radio adaptation is the the listener has to really work. Yeah, it's 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 an active listen. Yeah. It's not it, it's not something that you can you can put a film on and then play on your phone. If you if you're going to mm. if you're going to you know experience it, you have to you have to concentrate and and pay attention and that means that your imagination is working and that means that you know the 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 scenes are they're as graphic or as horrific or as real as as you can think them and it's yeah you know, it makes it really powerful. Um, uh, yeah, I you know I said I said it to the the guys in in, in the reunion as well. There's something about hearing Peter Spoden talk in the same way we got so used to hearing RAF, American, Canadian, Australian pilots talking about the act of shooting something down. Where, mm -hmm. at, but when it cuts to uh, the scene when um, Esprit Sugar gets shot and it's talking about where each of the shells is going um, and 
Oh, it's it's all orange, isn't it? When um uh when when Flash gets killed in the back when he's talking about the shell going through the tail gun, um, mm-hmm. and it cuts to Spoden talking about how he would line up and where he he'd put his shells. It's that matter of fact is the wrong the wrong phrase, but you know what I mean. That sort of here is a man who was good at his job explaining how he did his job exactly the same way we were used to hearing Battle of Britain pilots and and Mustang pilots and you know, Jaeger talking about getting his kills. There's something oddly chilling about hearing it in a German accent um, when it's happening to characters you've just spent, you know, in the case of Bomber, the entire afternoon with. You know, it's there's there's something about hearing him talking about doing his job it, that is is really affecting. Well, I think that's what Dayton was trying to do with the book as well. I mean, he talks in at, at the end about wanting to write a, a, a novel about mechanicalization of war and bringing it back to the human story. Yeah. And you get that. I mean, whoever is telling the story, whichever side the fighter pilot's on, um, you know, they are attacking the aircraft. They're not thinking about the people at the time. They think about the people later on when they've, when they've landed. And, you know, then they start to wonder what they're bullets or cannon shells are doing but it is the the way of getting across the the horror and the imperson you know how impersonal the war is mm-hmm. um and uh, again the, the the way with the with the radio um and tom baker's um narration it it goes into slow motion for that that scene you know you, you're being told where each individual shell goes and what it does and you know the, the burst is only matter of seconds but it's yeah you the the listener just sits there spellbound and shocked listening to it and just imagining the, the horror it's um, um yeah powerful stuff the, the the one thing that always i know it's cut for time but the the things going wrong for the night fighters as well the the aircraft that crashes into the lake and, and things showing how difficult that mm. job was um for them as well because you know flying at night's bad enough but flying at night in a underpowered overloaded ju88 as well um that that's it's a shame that didn't make that go read the book ladies and gentlemen that scene is Mm. is quite something um where were where was the first time you guys heard the adaptation i seem to remember listening to it with my dad on the day and checking the radio times when it when it was on um but i remember more clearly having it on cassette and listening to it myself um and i i mean I've, how old was i when it, it came out i would have been about seven or eight and i think that little bit older when i listened to it on cassette i i, I took it in more and i think yeah i i shouldn't really have been listening to it <laughs> at that age but um you know what it's like. It explains a lot. Um, yeah, that, that little bit older, it, it really, really sunk in. And actually, I hadn't listened to it for a while until uh, we started speaking about it. Man, I thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna dig this up again. It had been a, you know, a few years. And also with my current writing for my PhD, I'm looking at the Royal Air Force um, in the Second World War and interpretation since, and especially in the collective memory, public memory. A lot has happened since then. I've done a lot of, of research and, and looking at other productions and stuff, and it really, really still stands. It's still incredibly powerful. I, I think it's, I use the word balance, but just the, the, the multiple voices really do something. And um, yeah, it, it, it struck me. But when I first watched it, yeah, I, I, I listened to it. So, sorry. I was very young and it's a little bit vague. I don't think I really knew what it was, to be honest. I probably went to bed before it finished. I can't remember. But yeah, I remember it being a thing. And I, my dad was into Doctor Who, as was I. And it was a bit like, oh, it's Tom Baker. Wow. You know, he's, what was it? Doctor Who and, and aircraft. That was what, what I was <laughs> nuts about growing up. I was like, oh, the two are almost merged together. But you soon forgot about it. You know, Tom was very, very different in this. And I, I think read it absolutely wonderfully. Um and I don't know, not the word deadpan, but it's 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 just so matter of fact, the way that he says some of these things are absolutely horrific when you start thinking and picturing about it. Um, and almost, yeah, just this, just this, 
yeah, the, 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 just just mm. the power of it is it, it, absolutely wonderful, and it really really helps carry that story. You can't really imagine if you did it as a straight sort of radio play, it it, it wouldn't work. That narration really really. What's weird with the narration as well? I mean, we we spoken about spoilers. He he does give away sort of hints of what you know. Yeah, mm. you know, this will be the last flight of of O Orange Creaking Door. Um, but then of course there is a bit of a twist because mm. you know you think uh oh. But yeah, you know, some of them do get back. Um, I first uh, heard heard it. I had to seek it out because I missed it when it was when it went out live. Um, I listened to it. I I, I sought sought it out when I was doing my masters, um, and then again more recently when I started thinking about the interpretation for the Bomber Command Center, um, because that's what we tried to do in the exhibition there it's it's telling the stories from both sides of the conflict in the air and on the ground and uh, yeah um mm. yeah we've we've done it with a, a handful of interpretation panels each with 150 words on and, and dayton got a whole book and <laughs> the radio show got uh well it's nine and a half hours of broadcast time but with well, what is it three hours 40 minutes if you listen to the whole thing yeah like that. um so yeah, it's, it's 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 been been really important, I think. Um, well, let's start picking it apart a bit, mm-hmm. and because be, there's, you know, I having spent now, goodness, in the in the last week, a lot of time on this. It's it's been living rent free in my head quite quite heavily over over the bank holiday my wife asking me what i'm thinking about it's for the last few days it's been it's been this because it 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 sticks in your head and like i said earlier it's very it's very on the nose and i don't think if it was written today that would happen but we're going to get to that later um but let's let's start looking into into the story a bit and dan is the chap for this question really and i know what his first answer is going to be but in my questions, I've just written LMF, but then I asked my fantastic damn castiers on Patreon um, if they had any questions. And of course, straight straight up comes the wonderful Joe Wilding, friend of the show, guest previously, and he writes my questions better than me. So Dan, really, how did the approach to LMF evolve in the wake of World War II? Because we're seeing in Bomber a very specific view of it how did the rf really handle that versus perhaps the perception that is that bomber has probably not helped with okay so yeah my quick answer is go read my paper folks which you can you can you can find um sorry so what do we mean by lmf in case l- lack of moral fiber yeah. so it's been sort of spun or regarded as a medical term but it's not a medical term it was never a medical diagnosis it's was always a, a, a negative decision about the ability of uh, of an airman to carry on flying and, his, and do his operation. So you could volunteer to become air crew. You weren't allowed to say, actually, thanks very much, I've had enough. Mm. So it was quite a draconian measure that was used to persuade um, air crew to keep flying. And the way they did that was by making um, the alternative to flying and possibly being killed or injured was deemed to be more horrific than than actually being killed or injured. Now, the way it worked mostly was because the the rumour of this thing was so powerful. Um, There were three different letters, executive letters sent round to all station commanders explaining the procedure of what what you were meant to do if somebody came to you and said, I don't want to fly anymore. Um, But the letter was interpreted differently by different COs and different... um, different people in charge. Um, the CO did have to work quite closely with a medical officer, but again, it was all down to interpretation and a lot of what happened to somebody who refused to fly was you know, down to the character of the medical officer and the experience of the medical officer or the CO. What, what actually happened um, in most cases was the person was removed from the station as quickly as possible because they thought you know, this would spread, it would catch, although again, it's not, it's not a medical diagnosis. Uh, and it's also not PTSD. I get quite annoyed about that. Um, but what would happen? Uh, what was meant to happen was they would be uh, the the person would be removed from the station. Um, they would probably go through um, 
some sort of medical examination because if they could find a, med a genuine medical reason, a genuine medical diagnosis why this person couldn't fly, they weren't knowing that. They wouldn't go down that route. Um, and they were, you know, if they were found to be LMF, and the numbers are, are quite quite low. I, I've forgotten the facts and figures. Read my article, folks. Uh, the link um, will be in the description to this this, you, this thank very you. podcast. Yeah. Um, they would, you know, uh, if you're an officer, you would you would lose your rank. If you were a, a non commissioned officer, you would be busted down to AC two and and sent elsewhere. Um, the issue I have with with the book is there is this sort of pseudo letter from um, from the admin officer at, at RF Station Warley Fen, which is a, a pure work of fiction because it makes it sound like this is. Um, you know, the CEO who has made the decision that this chap is LMF and this is what's going to happen to him. Um, and that's not the case. Everybody was, was, was seen by medical professionals, the trick cyclists, the, uh, the psychiatrists or the neurologists. Um, and towards the end of the war, they were also, everyone was interviewed by a chap called Wing Commander James Lawson. Um, the rumour, the, the terrifying rumour that went round that proved so effective is that these chaps would be paraded in front of the entire squadron and their badges of rank and their brevet, their wings would be ripped off and they'd be marched away in disgrace. Um, I think it did happen, but it happened on very few stations, and it's due to you know, the CEO deciding that was what was going to happen. But um, I've also read accounts where somebody spent months being sent from pillar to post and going through lots of different surveys and interviews and medical you know, um, diagnostic checks. To, to see what was up with him. And it, after they had decided a, a, a panel with three senior officers that he was LMF, he was quietly asked to give give his stripes and his um, his wing in. So, you know, there wasn't the, the humiliating parade as far as he was concerned. Um, and also, it did become slightly more lenient as, um, as the war went on. And certainly someone like Lambert in this, in the book and in the, in the radio play, it, what was he forty-eight ops he'd done? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't, they couldn't have done that to him. You know, there's there's an interesting class element in uh, in the history of LMF, and there's an interesting class element in the book. I mean, um, going back to when I did I did history and English lit combined as, a, as an undergrad, and the first thing you think of when you read a new novel is is this is this about class, race, or gender? And this one is very much about class. It's it's throughout the whole the whole book. Um, and as far as LMF goes, because of the, you know, the culture at the time, it's a bit like the, the first world war. If you're an officer who couldn't take it anymore, you had anxiety. If you're, uh, in other ranks, if you're a private, it was hysteria. There's this sort of feminine aspect to it. And with the RAF, um, it was thought the lack of moral fiber more affected the sergeant air crew and also the different trades. So it, it it shouldn't happen to a, a, a navigator or a pilot because you know they were cut above your know, wireless operators, air gunners, and flight engineers. And so there's there's this whole element element of class goes throughout it. Um, have I answered the question? No, I, I, I'm just happy listening to you because it's <laughs> ha having having read your paper before before delving into this pair of things. It, it is a it's fascinating and harrowing, and it's. It makes more sense than what happens to Lambert in this, it's, you know, because you know, this is the second time he bring in in this particular book. It's the second time he brings back an aircraft with most of his crew dead. Yeah, you know, mm. it's 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 not. You know, he's he has shown that that is not the case for him, and I think maybe Dighton's doesn't play that inner t turmoil of of Lambert well enough. It, like I said, it comes across a bit a bit flat, um, but. It is, it is there and it's, it feels very late sixties description of it. And I don't know whether that's right, but it feels like that whole lions led by donkeys sort of, mm -hmm. um, and it plays in the book and the radio show that, yeah, look what these terrible toffs did to this working class hero. And mm. that's kind of doesn't sit with me. Um, I, I, throwing that out as an open question really if if it's if it is just me tell me but i i think that's that's how i've always read it and, and listened to it and i just think it doesn't doesn't quite feel right 
I, I think you're right. And I think it's it's even obvious to the point that you've got the, mm. oh, he won't play cricket. You know, it's it's that on the nose actually that uh, it, yeah, I'm, I'm the same. It's 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 one thing that does uh, does jar me. Um, listening to it, yes, because that's the whole, whole bit in the book as well about the upcoming cricket match, isn't it? As 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 well, which yeah, thankfully yeah. Joe Dunlop cut out of the radio show because that doesn't make yeah. any sense at all. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's I mean it's it's a it's a great narrative. It's a it's a it's a great hook. It, it drags people in because you know they they do get. Yeah, you know, it's it's annoying, and you get upset that such a thing could happen to somebody. So I can I can understand why it's it's yeah. in the book. It's you know it's another way of making making them seem to be seem to be victims. I mean, yeah, um, Sweet is the bad guy in the book. Um, yeah, we've mm-hmm. we've got this multi- we've got these multiple narratives where people empathise and and associate and, and can feel you know what's going on from all sorts of different perspectives. But, I mean, okay, you, you, also, you also do feel for Sweet a bit, but it's, you know, the, he, he is the sort of moustache-twirling villain in, the, in this piece, isn't he? Um, <laughs> so it's really quite interesting because, you know, the, the book sort of sets out what Dayton had been told by some veterans in the late 60s uh, when he was doing his research. And then, you know... From my experience working with volunteers and veterans and recording interviews with them, because because memory is so so tricky and complicated, and you, you're recording oral histories of people years, decades after the after the events, everything that they have seen, read, heard, watched becomes an influence on their story. And um, particularly, I think with with lack of moral fiber. Um, the story that's set out in this book then sort of confirms the rumours that were going around actually during the war itself, and it becomes you know more set in stone that this is this is the narrative, this is what happened. Um, I'm re- I'm I'm glad that he, he actually did it the way he did, and you know, didn't mention that this the, the parade that is is mentioned in, in by other people. It's always when people when veterans do talk about it, it's always something that happened to somebody else on another squadron, and they didn't see it, but this is what happened, folks. Um, and I think part of part of the, the the idea of what happened, the procedure, comes from things like this book. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, among our collection of kamikaze aircraft. Um, we have two versions of the Oka, which was a suicide rocket-powered human-guided bomb. This version here is the two-seat trainer version. We made a couple of them that were uh, launched on a catapult with one rocket engine that they would use to train uh, potential OCA pilots. Um, We have the instructor in the back and the student up front. It technically could glide and they could land it back on the skid and, you know, learn how to fly the operational version of the aircraft. It also had a longer wingspan to allow it to uh, perform as a glider. The operational OCA right over here, um, which is on loan from the Royal Air Force Museum, um, the trainer version is actually on loan from the National Air and Space Museum. The operational OCA was an anti-shipping, human-guided suicide bomb. It would be loaded underneath a Japanese T4M Betty bomber. Um, It would be launched at four three rockets in the back, if I recall correctly, and really only had about less than a minute, only maybe about, it was about 20 or 30 seconds worth of uh, actual flight time. And then I'm kind of going to a terminal dive on, on a ship guided by the suicide or kamikaze pilot flying the aircraft. They weren't all that successful, um, not because of the design itself. The biggest problem being the fact that they were strapped on a Japanese Betty they had to get within about 20 miles of the American fleet, which meant most of them were shot down while still strapped on the Japanese bomber. Um, but they did have a few successes uh, off of Okinawa. So the aircraft behind it is a Nakajima Ki-115 Surugi, which is another purpose-built kamikaze aircraft. During the war, the majority of kamikaze aircraft leading up to you know, the end of the war 
were mostly repurposed aircraft, so Zeros, Oscars, Bettys, Bells, etc. Um, with the Sarugi, the Japanese Army Air Service was building an aircraft specifically designed from bottom up as a one-way mission kamikaze suicide special attack force aircraft. Um, the wings are made out of aluminum. The fuselage is essentially made out of metal that's no different than you'd have in air ducting. That's why it's kind of rusted. The inside of the cockpit is all very rudimentary with like wooden, made out of wood, wood control stick and throttle, maybe three or four gauges at best. Um, the landing gear actually dropped off the aircraft so that they could repurpose them. Also, you know, it kind of forced, I will say it probably also forced the Japanese pilot onto his, to complete his mission or attempt to complete his mission. So once you uh, drop the landing gear, the explosive or bomb that's armed underneath your aircraft, you're not exactly going to be able to belly land that aircraft without uh, destroying yourself in the aircraft. But this was kind of shows just like how desperate the Japanese were getting at the end of the war, just making these mass produced um, kind of like simple built aircraft um, just so they could have the sheer numbers for them for the uh, what they expected to be the decisive invasion of Japan uh, with the uh, first in Kyushu and then Honshu. But because of the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hirohito, realizing that they could not go on any longer, that they decided to surrender to the United States or in the Allies, I should say. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. It's one of those areas that I think, you know, with with your paper and things that we, we definitely need to talk about more because it has become a trope um yeah you know very much of you 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 look at as you're saying you look at the first world war and you have you know sassoon up on this this pedestal and the poets and you know all off at craig lockhart getting carefully looked after and and yeah to to be fair pat barker's regeneration does that quite well showing the difference between the care for the officers and the electroshock treatment for the the enlisted men it's, it's a similar sort of thing um here Gee. and it's again that's you know as you're saying that book straight up and down about class because you've even got the the officer up from the ranks and in, in bomber you've got lambert's wife trying to convince him to take a commission and and he won't do it and, and things and yeah because the other thing There's sorry a... the other thing that's just lambert of course is an old hand he's a, a 37 volunteer isn't he so that's that's the other part of his story is that he's yeah, yeah he's yeah. he's he's a lifer he's proper raf he's not um, yeah. Sorry, Dan, I, I spoke. Oh, no, I was just going to, it, it, going back to my research, there's a the, there's a chap who was a flight engineer who um, saw his mate, the bomb aimer, brutally killed right in front of him, and he sort of, he, he, he froze and couldn't do anything. I think he was, you know, screaming and, and running up and down when they landed, and, you know, uh, he, was, he was taken off. And they sent him to Matlock, which was the hospital for NCOs. Um, he never went down the lacrimal fiber route. He had a he had a medical diagnosis, and it, he received electroconvulsive therapy mm. for his for his problems as well. So. Mm. Let's switch things up a bit and go from traumas of the mind to traumas of high explosives falling on you. Um, <laughs> the German side of things, it's. I, I'm going to say something controversial here. I think the Craigfeld, Craigfeld, Craigfeld. Um, now that I'm bringing it up, he's quickly looking at the name of uh, Altgarden. There you go. Because Craig, Craig, yeah, Craig, Craigfeld's yeah, the, the target the, that they they miss. Um, I actually think that's the better section of the book, and I think it. it I feel that way because it's a story that we don't get to read or hear very often yeah. i'm going to throw this one to you james in your looking at the war in in public media in all of your mm. sort of research around the raf on film how much of it actually looks at the other side of the coin even say in the last 30 years very very little i mean you're seeing an influence because you get uh, european films that have and do do this but in terms of a british 
popular sort of memory of it, it, it is an unseen event. It is a, an unseen thing generally that that happens. I mean, yeah, you, you think about what's happening. The, the, the films of the 50s, you've got appointment in London, you've got the, the German perspective from the defences, but you don't see what's happening on the ground. Um, Dam busters, you just see a few people running away from some flooding water. And yeah, you go on from that, you, you get TV productions like uh, Bomber Harris again. It's, there's, it is in that room, it is Bomber Command headquarters. There's quite a lot, really. Yeah, you, you just don't get it. I mean, you had the film, uh, um, I forgot what it's called now, The Bombardment on Netflix that showed collateral damage, but it was Denmark. It wasn't Germany again. You have things like The Book Thief where you have um, bombing raids in it and such like. But again, it, it's, it's a European influence. It's not a British perspective. There is this reluctance really to go look at what was happening on the ground. Um, so that's one thing that I think I really like about Bomber is that it is this chance to do this. And it is. A, and I think, yeah, the, the scenes are played really, really interestingly. You do have themes like the myth of the clean Luftwaffe that, that's mentioned. You mm -hmm. know, I think that's a very interesting area that's that's brought into it. So on that and other basis, I think, um, yeah, it, it covers a lot of ground that you don't normally see in these sort of productions. Um I think you do see it in documentaries um, and you see it in some quite sensationalized documentaries. We're not mentioning um, the Canadian sensationalized documentary on this podcast. No. So don't even think about bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, the other, the other thing with it is when, when it's uh, the radio adaptations, made, it's obviously in February 95, 50 years after Dresden almost to the day um and bomber harris is repeated uh on on tv at the, at the same time originally shown 3rd of september 1989 it's repeated together and obviously that's got quite a heavy focus on dresden and you've had documentaries that are focused on it as well so i don't think it's any coincidence really that you know the, the scheduling was like that and the fact that it's moved to february was that intentional was that just when the production got kicking and it was broadcast we don't. I don't know. Um, that's that's something that I would have liked to have asked. See, if you, if you, and, and if, if you were there, or yeah, out, yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Here we go. But you know, it, it, it that as well keeps that um, and probably reinforces the. I won't mention the film because we're not sipping our drinks. Um, and also, and also Dresden. That seems to be the two pervasive. You know, um, I can't think of the word prolonged memories when it comes or popular memories of bomber command mm. seem to be those two you know it, it's and it, it's i think that's reinforced a little bit but i don't know yeah you know. i mean i think with in this country the, the the popular memory of dresden it's 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 easy for people to kind of excuse it as a one-off and you know oh it was particularly dry and there yeah. was that wind Absolutely. blowing but um, it's, it's uncomfortable but that is what bomber command were trying to do every time they took off that's why they had the mix of bomb load and incendiaries that they always had that you know that was what they were aiming yeah. to do um and it's 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 not pleasant thinking yeah, and, about that and the, the book and the radio make that make that abundantly clear yeah and, and raid, raids like yeah. hamburg and cologne and lubeck and but you know all the, yeah we don't talk about those but i suppose with the with the dresden thing you've got the the politics you've got the the moment that Churchill starts shunning and there starts to be these conversations and this change in memory that adds to it as well. That, uh, and of course, post-war, what happens mm. with the Soviet Union and historians and Nazi figures being used and everything, you know, that amplifies that raid and that memory even more. I, it, yeah. it came up again today. There's the slaughter has five aspect as, as, as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I so it goes. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, mm. I feel for Vonnegut because he was trying to work out a lot of, trauma which was why he clung to the the big numbers of, of people like Irvin and and the the, the soviet propaganda i i can yeah. understand that but the fact that slaughterhouse five is then held up as an accurate depiction of it i think it's 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 a shame it doesn't do slaughterhouse five justice um for what that book is is actually about um sleeping with aliens i think it's what it's about but, <laughs> time trouble yeah um but it's 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 those interesting things, and I think how Dighton and then the guys that did the adaptation as well 
worked the, those outguard scenes in was it's it is every time you cut to it it's a bit of a gut punch because you you have the party you have mm. um yeah you know, <laughs> literally doomed love affair between um the uh the radar operator and, and uh, Anna Luisa um poor Anna Luisa she she was a bit of a goer um I, 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 like I say, it's race, class, or gender. There yeah, you go. There. Yeah. But it, it, you know it's going to yeah. happen in, as as soon as it starts. And I, I think where the genius of that raid sequence is, is that it's just the first wave. You go through all of that. Yeah. And then, yeah, the Burgermeister's handed the bit of paper saying there's there's another wave coming. There's another mm. 400 bombers. Um, and the, the second aspect of it is covered in a few pages and I think in about 20 seconds of Tom Baker's narration as well just sort of shows that these were very carefully orchestrated things you know as Dan you you'd probably be able to say better and as you said before these things were designed to cause mass damage and they weren't a constant Mm -hmm. stream of things they would stop and start and move and generally just get worse yeah, it was it was yeah you know, it was scientifically worked out and the timings were worked out and they you know they'd sent different waves in from different directions because they knew that you know the air crew would creep back and you know, they would set the, the target markers down so they would cover the the target areas as best they could. I mean, again, with with does it does it matter that that you know the whole uh, Elk Garden is is bombed because it was an accident? You know, this it's 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 part of the the fog of war. It's part of the horrors of war. I mean, again, with spoilers, that it's. I think it's quite a nice little touch that the two chaps are killed on a motorcycle, right mm-hmm. at the end of the book. Because yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that as, as well that just you know people don't don't think about. So there's there's little touches throughout it as well. There's uh, Mickey Martin getting killed um, on the ground uh, by the rescue workers. There's li- little moments of almost incidental horror that gets worked into the into the book and i think you know it's the 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 mickey martin scene has always stuck with me because he's he's sort of thinking he's about to be taken prisoner and of course those guys have just been trying to put the fire out at the uh, at the hospital which is another terrible scene it's just a, it's a horror movie and a horror book on this um yeah it's it, I've, I've written that down yeah it's it's yeah there's there's stephen king and there's this and uh, just just sort of on that yeah. do do we have figures for air crew i guess we could call it lynched um after they jumped out or is or is it just something that's imponderable I don't. Th- I think it's one of those things we'll ne- we'll never know. I mean, um, I could talk to the, the losses archivist. I know he's he's looking into it, but I've not I've not got any numbers to hand at the moment. All right, that 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 wasn't a prepared question, so I won't, no. I won't hold you to it. <laughs> I'm sure I found a figure in the hundreds, but again, it's difficult to pinpoint. And I remember not finding an exact one. It was just the the one that seemed to add up for me, but I didn't go into any major detail or. Or research over it. I was, mm. I was I was curious myself actually to find out um I actually think that that scene I don't want to use the word is my favorite but it's the one that um I, I really got to shiver up my spine listening to it because you have they have returned from the hospitals being bombed it's actually two enemies coming face to face that in a different circumstance he'd be bundled off to a POW camp or if there wasn't a war you know they'd be They'd be drinking beer together in a pub. It just, for me, just put so many thoughts into it my makes, head. It makes it um, and I actually, I actually had to pause yeah. it, you know, and I listened to it recently just to try and soak it in and and, and think about what was being. It makes said it and personal, doesn't it? it? So much of it is impersonal because you're dropping yeah. bombs on people from so many thousand feet, or you're you're opening yeah. fire from so many hundred yards. But that, it's yeah, it 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 brings the human the human side back into it, doesn't yeah. it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it is, it's that it also leaves things up to the imagination, which is the incredible thing really about the, the radio production and books in general as well. But 
the fact is it ends on the just let's go and get mm. the axes or whatever the, the, they say you know there's no description it's the, it's your imagination there that's going okay we know what's going to happen yeah and i think that's that's a really clever piece of writing uh, and a very 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 powerful piece of writing as well I've kind of said it's it's all on the nose and it's 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 a very carefully designed book to pile horror upon you know as as you said dad it's it's Stephen King and then there's 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 this I, I guess putting the historian's hat on how how does how he's looking for his historian's yeah. hat yeah yeah <laughs> I'm trying to see if I got a hat I, I, yeah, I think you get it I, I think you get it when you get to your oh, your, your vibe I've got a dolphin mask. <laughs> Well, let's put, put the tin hat, hat there. Actually, let's put the tin hat on. Here. I can't reach it. Is I suppose my question is that's all staying in the edit, boys. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the black humour that you need when you've been discussing this sort of stuff, isn't yeah. it? That's the that's the people who we interview. They'll tell you a story like this. It could be out of the out of the book or, mm. or, or from the radio thing, and then they'll tell you a joke. Yeah. 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 I guess my question really is. Does this sit well in the history of Bomber Command? Is it too on the nose to do the strategic bombing campaign justice? Because it, it is it is something that has lived very long. For something that doesn't get repeated very often, I think it's only been on four extra a few times and on the main channel once or twice. But it's something I've mentioned that we've been doing this and it it immediately gets people talking and going, oh, I remember that. Yeah, you know, it. Mm. I think we we've, we've covered that. It. It's probably not the most accurate, and it's horror upon horror strung together for effect. But has this had an outsized influence on how we think of Bomber Command? I don't think in the big picture it probably has. I think other things will come to to public mind first, which I think is a tremendous shame because I think when it comes to the strategic bombing campaign and and bombing in the Second World War, actually, that that, that that's that's broaden this out is an incredibly complex and long story where it comes from. You've got to look at the First World War. You've got to look at the bomber as a deterrent in the interwar years, the fear that comes with it, um, and the start of the war where there is the scale of it is so much less. And there are, you know, you do have the bombers in daylight going to attack um, Kriegsmarine German naval ports and making sure that they drop the bombs flying away from the coast so that they don't risk killing, you know, to it escalate into Hamburg, to escalate into the firebombing of Tokyo, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there is a massive story here to to, to, to comprehend and understand, which in the, I mean this in the nicest sense is not going to be learnt very quickly. And most people won't be aware of that when it comes to, to this story. I think, though, that what you can do and what Bomber does incredibly well is say that this is horrific and it's horrific for a lot of mm. people in different ways. And it's not drop our bombs let's go home for tea and medals um which i'm not a fan of i get that it was a thing and i get that it would have been a, a tool in propaganda during the war but to still have that as a narrative i think is dangerous and frankly quite disrespectful um to a lot of people but that's that's what i think i think bomber that realism yeah it is on the nose but it it was pretty awful <laughs> i you know. i think that if as many people were aware of the book and the the radio play as are aware of um, the Dan Busters film and, to lesser extent, Rickles' book. Yeah, cheers, folks. Um, I think we would have a, a much more rounded understanding of the of the bombing war. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a as I said, it's a, it's a brilliant way in if you don't know anything about it, and it does make you ask more questions and hopefully sends you down you know, the, the rabbit warren of doing more research for yourself. It doesn't talk about the, the historical debate. It doesn't talk about was the strategy the right one. It it doesn't talk about it, – it doesn't even talk about the ethics or morals of it. It's, it's basically mm. reporting this is you know kind of what, what went on and, and the horrors of it. But it's mm. also – it's – you can you can read some books that have come come later, and even some veteran memoirs, and it tends to be this happened, and then this happened, and this happened, and then this happened. At the end, and it's not it's not a, a boring, narrow minded one sort of perspective description, or um, it's 
it does go into into depth and you have got these intertwined narratives and it really makes the reader or the listener think. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's 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 important in the memory of Bomber Command and it, I, I would like it to be more well-known. Yeah. You can see why they made Memphis Bell. Well, they wanted they wanted a very young Dan Ellen to be an extra yeah. in it. That's, that's the only reason they made that film. <laughs> Had to have a haircut and everything. I remember reading that. <laughs> that's so, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that's exactly what Memphis Bell does, though, isn't it, really? There's no real thought about the people on the ground. The guys in the bomber are the, are the victims, and everything is against them getting back. Mm. Um, whereas this yeah. is is more balanced. Yeah, and they go around again, don't they? Because they don't want to risk bombing the school. Yes, but then you you, you still don't yeah. see what you know. You, what they? Yeah, no, yeah you very much you, doubt that they all landed. You'll get you me know, onto my precision rant if you if you start talking about yeah, that. which is wonderful because the the book or the 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 radio program don't even don't even go there. It's just this is what we're doing, chaps. Here's the briefing. This is the target. Yeah. I mean, he does ask the question, doesn't he? Um, what what is it that we're hitting? Um, and that's an, you know, oh, that's bad form, that's bad show. It obviously means that he's a he's a bit bulky and he's probably that's not wavering, they so they say is, but it's along those lines, isn't it? Wind, windy, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I think I think you're right. the The fact that it is as matter of fact as it is is to its its credit. Yeah, um, I've just read one book for author. I'm going to into. And there's a couple lines in it where there's the classic writerly, this was before the moral conundrums of the later parts of the bombing campaign. And that was makes me a, a mm. bit cross because it, it's a get out for not understanding more of it, which, um, you know, the, the I think the moral debate is an interesting one. And I think it's one that is one of those sort of debating society sort of things that can get a little bit out of hand um but like you're saying james as, as well and and dan that long march to the wonder area weapon one bomb one sissy you know that mm -hmm. it is kind of a straight line when you start seeing all the problems that they're trying to figure out to get to that point where they would have what they dreamt of in the 30s mm -hmm. it's um i i don't see it as a compromise i see it as the devil's problem solving isn't it it's yeah how the hell do we do this mm. Mm. it's not a terribly uplifting chat this one is it it's <laughs> no it, yeah it, I'm, I'm with you i've been I've, it's been in my head for the, the you know since we we, we spoke or was it? it was friday mm. wasn't it um yeah and yeah thanks <laughs> <laughs> It's been a actual. It's I say pleasure. It's been it has been a pleasure to go back and, and spend time with it because it's one of those things that you kind of think maybe there's an opportunity there for for somebody to to do it again and take take another take on the material. I think mm -hmm. um, some of our recent documentaries about this sort of thing have had moments. I'm not going to name any names, but they tend to still be tech worshipy of the aircraft rather than the important bit, which is the people that are mm -hmm. um, in it. And I think that kind of has, has let things down, but it's, we, we to, to me, we seem to be in a place where we're, we're glorifying the, the technology and the, you know, the, this mad craze for flying around in, in the back of Spitfires and, and things like that, that, that seems to be missing some of the, the, the wider narratives that, um, that we could we could get to but not that yeah i'd turn down sitting in the back of the canadian lancaster there's a seat going and someone wants to fly me to hamilton i'd do that in a shot but yeah it's fun you should try it oh, i see yeah <laughs> <laughs> i knew i knew that was gonna happen at some point to be to be fair i had to sign I a piece it. of paper saying that if i die during this flight it's not my you know it's not your fault it's okay yeah. And and I was yeah. frightened, <laughs> and no one was shooting at me. So. Well, yeah, that I think my my last public is I remember when it was over. Was it uh, uh, twenty fourteen? Um, yeah, I was down at Goodwood for the festival of speed, and, and Vera and the the BBMF flank came over. And you know, yes, they're at low level. Everything was shaking, and it was listening to this. I think the thing that the radio show did so well was the soundscape just that constant noise mm. 
as well, which even you know, yeah, even to the for, you know, I was just thinking of um, James Scott's book about uh, the, the the firestorm is in Tokyo as well, where the, the survivors would talk about just the the rush of the air plus the noise of the engines of the low level bombers as well. That that must have been terrifying. But. Yeah, I mean, it's the thing that all all the films get wrong with the Foley, isn't it? Because you don't hear the you, you don't hear anti aircraft fire if you're in, in a Lancaster, but you have to have it in. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, the the radio sh- thing. I think some of the, the the minor strings were are a little bit intrusive. I think they would probably change that if they did that now. And we've spoken about Tom Baker's wonderful narrative. Mm. Yeah. I think a modern audience has to get well, not so much modern because that's quite old now, but you, you have to get past. Tom Baker on Little Britain being the narrative voice on that a little bit. Yeah. Oh, um, but again, I don't think he would have got that you gig know. if he hadn't had this one. Yeah. It, it, it's funny because they said um, they wanted James Naughty for it, mm. which I think would work. Mm. It would it would be different. But there's yeah, there's something about the way. To- yeah. And and um, who was it that played Harris? Frank, Frank, Frank Windsor. Windsor. Yeah. Um, because he, he, I thought Windsor. his voice was was spot on for that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, probably better than Max Wall, yeah. eh, James? Right, we're 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 waffling now, gents. Final, Sorry. final, final thoughts, James. What would you like to say to wrap up? Gosh, if you haven't read the book or listened to the radio production, we've probably ruined it for you with the plot. Um, we haven't. No, go out and uh, listen to it, read it. I think it's if you haven't, I I think it's brilliant. Um, yeah, it, it's not without faults. There are things that could be different, and I'd be very interested to see if it was made now what it would be like and whether it would. Yeah, w- w- I don't think it would be a radio production. I think it would definitely be on on screen. I think it'd be very interesting to think about what it would would be like. Just go out there and, and experience it if you haven't. I can't say anything more than that. Yeah, uh, give it a listen, give it a read. Don't expect the sort of traditional comfortable. Hurrah for the RAF and back in time for tier medals, folks. Um, you know, we, we have given some spoilers. The the, the thing you got to do is is try and guess who makes it and who doesn't. I specifically did not want to talk about what happens on Oh Orange because it, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> but there we go. What might be fun is have this conversation again post Masters of the Air. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So if you if you chaps are up for it, let's. Let's let's reconvene because I yeah, have yeah. a sneaking suspicion that's going to be a bit Memphis belly. Yeah, to quote George Harrison, I would be quite prepared for that eventuality. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, thank you. I cannot thank Dan and James enough for joining me on the podcast. That was a lot of fun. James tried desperately hard to be able to join us for the main reunion, but him being stuck in traffic has meant we've been able to have a proper discussion with Dan about this. And I think it's all turned out for the best, even though he's still upset he missed out. As always, the links will be populated with some fantastic stuff in the description. Most of all is Dan's paper on lack of moral fiber. I highly encourage everyone to have a look at that because it really does bring a lot of light to a subject as we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, needs that light to be shed upon it. Their social media links are going to be in the description below. Do give them both a follow because they are fab and they share some incredible stuff as well. And as you've heard, they're both thoroughly decent chaps. As always, thank you so much for listening, supporting the pod. You are all ace. If you can, stick some stars into your podcast app of choice. Leave a review. Let me know how I'm doing. We can make changes everything's up in the air go for it feel free of course if you fancy joining us on patreon you get all of these episodes early three pounds a month and we have some fun over there as well and as you heard sometimes we even let you ask questions even when they're better than the ones i prepare there we go of course we can't wrap up an episode without thanking the fantastic team at the pima air and space museum for the continued sponsorship of the podcast Their links are always in the descriptions. Check them out. They've got some fun stuff coming up over the summer. If you're in the area, you cannot miss it. It's a fantastic place to go to geek out about planes and do so much more than that. So until next time, thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.